Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining. Well, it's now reporting season and I call it hunting season when we go looking for good value companies for the years ahead. Now, one company reporting today is Elmo Software. And we have the CEO of ELO, Danny Lesson, on the program tonight after it reported pretty well, but share price fell. We'll see if he can give us a leg up for the company going forward. Later in the show, Paul Rickard will look at those companies that report today and Julia Lee of Berman Invest and June Bay Lou of Tribeca Alpha Plus will give their assessments on some of these reporting companies as well as well as a group of companies that you guys have been asking us about when you've sent us in some uh, information or some questions for us to we'll do that with our charts guy as well Mike Gable who will run his eye over Origin, AGL, Appen, Vega Cheese and Woodside and the stock that he actually likes right now. And I'll keep that as a secret. Make, you, make sure you watch the show. So without any further ado, let's catch up with Julia Lee of Berman Invest. And joining us now is Julia Lee from Berman Invest. Good to see you, Julia. Great to be here, Pete. Let's just run through some of the companies that reported today. And we are interviewing Danny Lesson from Elmo later in the program. Um, what do you think of the report? Uh, there were a number of reports today. Uh, for me, the highlight was Suncorp Metway. Uh, the shares were up around about 8% on the market. And what, I think one of the highlights this reporting season is really going to come from those insurance companies as well as the banks. Both the diversified fin financials, the insurers, as well as the banks have a very strong capital position at the moment. And for insurance, if you add into the mix that you are seeing premiums growing. So globally, premiums have seen double digit growth. And here domestically, we've been seeing some growth as well. And then when you think about it, in things like general insurance, where say car insurance, a lot of people are in lockdown. They're unable to drive their car long distances, so less car accidents, less claims. And that's uh, likely not only in the area of car insurance, but things like home and contents, as well as health insurance as well. So a bit of a nirvana environment for those insurers um, and the banks, of course, the capital position. I think the thing to watch out for with the banks is how conservative they are in their payouts, given that we're seeing lockdowns once again uh, mm -hmm. in many states of Australia. Elmo, I thought, was an interesting one. Um, the last time that they gave out guidance was back in May, um, and they came within their guidance, um, probably towards a little bit of the lower end on some of the metrics, although on the earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortisation, they definitely had a beat there. But back in May, the share price was at $4.62. So we have seen a bit of a rally into this result. And I guess a bit of an expectation that we would see Elmo beating expectations. But obviously, coming in within expectations isn't enough for the market at the moment, which today, once again, traded at all-time record highs. So Elmo was interesting. It hit $5.70 earlier on and then was sold off and ended the day below $5. So a lot of volatility in terms of the share price. I think having a look at the growth numbers, they were looking good. I think that the market was expecting more. But if you're looking at a two to three year time frame, I mean, when you're looking at cloud based services in things like HR and expenses, and you've got a workforce which is basically working from the cloud at the moment, the growth profile for this company isn't looking bad. I think the only thing was that, um, you know, they, they pretty much hit guidance, which they indicated back in May, and the share price then was $4.62. Today it ended at $5. Yeah. To me, it seems like, I've always said that this is a company that's going to benefit from not only reopening when companies that may well be holding back on spending will start spending again, but the fact that a lot more people will be working from home means to control that staff, you might need some kind of computer program with a dashboard so people can say they love you or hate you or want to leave you. And that's all going to be important for HR people and small business people as well. Absolutely. I mean, Pete, I think structurally it's in the right place. We can talk about trends of people working from home and needing the infrastructure to be able to support that. It's definitely in the right place. But I think what happened with Elmo's share price today is really 
um, symbolic of what happens during reporting season. And that is, you know, a lot is already priced into the share price and the expectations that they gave and the estimates they gave back in May were already built into the share price. So when you want to see another leg up in terms of the share price, you need new positive information to come through. So reporting season is one of those things where sometimes you see record revenue, record profit results coming through and the share price still falls. And that's because the market needs new positive information to be able to give the company a higher valuation. And today, Elmo came in within expectations. Not only that, we saw the NASDAQ futures also pointing down about 0.3% during our session. So all the tech stocks were pretty much sold off. And one of the points that came out from Wall Street on Friday was because of that really good job number in the US, there's an expectation, well, and a 10 year bond yields went up. And usually when the bond yields go up, tech stocks get sold off. <laughs> I think it's yeah. <laughs> On yields, I mean, it's been so volatile. Uh, initially, you know, earlier on in the year, we saw this as well, the tech sell-off and US bond yields rising. And then over the last few months, we've had a bit of a cruise around with bond yields coming back, the share market hitting all-time record highs. And then bang, on Friday, we saw those strong non-farm payroll numbers coming out of the US and bond yields once again rising. And combined together with the $1 billion infrastructure package that Biden's looking to get through and has bipartisan support of at the moment, and you're probably looking at a strong growth environment for the US, which means rising interest rates. So we know what uh, rising interest rates does to those companies with future growth and future cash flows, and that is discount them back to a discounted share price. And that's sort of what we're seeing with growth and uh, the NASDAQ as well as some of those tech companies at the moment, once again. It is interesting, um, Julia, and I think normal people ponder this, that a tech company is called a growth company and all the outlooks for economic growth is really, really strong. And interest rates, we've been told, are gonna be kept on hold. So, this is not your normal relationship. We would normally think high growth, oh yes, interest rates will take off soon, but they might not take off as quickly as normal. So it may well be one of those old generalizations that might not work in the short term. There could be a buying opportunity for the career. Yeah, and I think this is a major thing for investors to be thinking about at the moment. At the moment, the growth numbers coming out of the US are relatively strong. They're stronger than expected. And the market's pricing in interest rate hikes in the US sooner than expected, as well as tapering of that asset purchase program by the Federal Reserve. But we're still seeing that Delta variant, seeing rising hospitalization and rising cases over in the US. So the big question is like places in Asia, like Australia, like we have seen in many areas of the world, do we see the Delta variant and COVID-19 once again hitting the growth aspirations of the US? And I think a case in point were some of the China trade numbers which came out today. We saw the fourth consecutive month where China imported less iron ore. Um, and of course, that's had an impact not only um, in terms of their steel production, which has decreased, um, but also iron ore prices, which have come back uh, just over 20%. Yeah, okay. Now, before I let you go, I'm going to throw a couple of strange ones at you. Bigger cheese. Do you have a view on bigger cheese? Yeah, you know, I love food companies, Steve, because uh, I love food. Um, but uh, I think that, <laughs> I think when you're analysing a food company, it's a different thing. Well, one, um, a lot of the time when you're analysing companies, it's about supply and demand. And when you're looking at a company like Beaker, I guess it's about how much dairy we're consuming. And unfortunately, the dairy trends have been negative um, in the last half year. And that's really why we've seen Beaker share price coming under a bit of pressure. And then it seems to be sort of overpowered paying for its milk um, compared to some of its competitors at the moment. The growth from bigger cheese really comes from the acquisitions it's, it makes and then the synergies um, that it extracts, which basically means it acquires a company, there's a duplication of costs, so it strips out some of those costs, and that um, that helps the bottom line. But in this type of environment, I guess um, we need to see uh, milk trends going in the right direction and a positive direction first. So, look, I think... Um, when you're investing in food companies, it's a little bit more difficult because it's a bit harder to get an idea around some of the trends. But the trend at the moment has been a bit weak in terms of milk consumption. If that was to turn around, I guess that would be a positive for bigger share price. One last one before you go. Uh, some months ago, um, you uh, said you like Bluescope and Bluescope has delivered nicely. 
Are you still a holder of blue, blue scope? And would you add more to blue scope now? Yeah, I have, we have sold blue scope, but only because um, I don't think that the margins that we're seeing in steel are completely sustainable. And I guess we've lightened off a lot on the miners as well. I think global growth is going to soften off a bit, given that we have seen uh, COVID-19 once again uh, having some problems. So this reporting season, I think, will be an extremely interesting one because there's a bit of a tug of war between what's happened in the past 52 weeks, which is extremely strong results coming through from the miners, and what's likely to happen across the next 52 weeks and that's probably some weaker prices and more subdued growth coming through um, so in that type of environment i think the real test for some of these mining commodity based companies is going to be whether shareholders hold on to the stock after uh, the the ex-dividend date because there will be some outsized huge dividends coming through. Um, I, I, at the moment, the type of uh, commodity players that we're holding include, uh, we have BHP because I think it's going to come out with a massive dividend and capital management next week. Um, but also we hold things like Oracobre, um, things that give us exposure to, I guess, lithium and the battery story. Yeah, new age miners, I call them, and I think they are going to be popular going forward. <laughs> yes, I think there's going to be lots of big dividends in store this reporting season, not only from the miners, but the banks as well as the insurers. So I don't think you want to be short dividends going into this reporting season because that makes up a lot of the returns that come through for the Australian share market, um, as well as the franking credits. I'm hoping it drives the uh, unit price of Switzer Dividend Growth Fund higher and higher, Julia. <laughs> Very good. Good to see you. Thanks, Pete. Become an annual Switzer Report subscriber and get unprecedented access to my seven investing principles where I reveal the exact strategies I use to invest. You'll get access to an exclusive PDF, video recording, and even a free copy of my book, Join the Rich Club. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, a Switzer Report subscription is one of the wisest investments you can make towards your future. Find out more at switzerreport.com.au slash YouTube offer or click on the link in the description below. And that was Julia Lee from Berman Invest and joining me now is Michael Gable from Fairmont Equities. And Michael, how are you? Good, Peter. How are you coping? Very good. I'm just loving this lockdown, mate. I have enough <laughs> of it. <laughs> okay. And as you can see, I'm so in love with the lockdown, I'm just preoccupying myself with stocks. One day these stocks will benefit from no lockdown. But the first one I want to look at today, I don't think it's had any impact at all from lockdown, and that is Origin. What are the mm. charts saying about Origin? I mean, the chart for Origin has been, been pretty ugly for a while. Um, as, as we could see with, uh, with the chart that I've, um, I've got here on the screen, look, it has been heading south for, for quite a while there. And... Um, the problem with the problem with this particular stock is even though it looks like there's some good support down at four dollars, so on the far right hand side, um, I've indicated with a line there the, the support levels. We can see over the last year that um, it has been making these lower highs. So um, with the arrows, um, each time it tries to rally, the selling kicks in, and and the share price heads lower. So although it's sitting at support. Um, it looks like it's not that far away from breaking under it and heading lower, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and, and look, it's a company that's been challenged for quite some time now. And, and what you're basically saying is nothing in that chart that makes you think that the worst is behind them. No, not, not yet, unfortunately. Okay, let's go to a, a kindred soul in a sense, a competitor in AGL. Is the news any better there when we look at the charts? Well, this, this one's even worse, Peter. Um, as, as we can see over the last um, several years or so, it's, um, it hasn't really made, well, it hasn't really made any progress for a very long time, um, depending on how you it. Um, it did peak there in 2017, but it's just been on a massive downtrend since then. So, yeah, very, very ugly looking chart. Uh, I know that there'd be people looking at that and tempting to, to buy it, thinking that well, if it's come back this way, it's surely got to bounce. But you know, you could have said the same thing this time last year when it was at seventeen dollars, having fallen from twenty-eight to seventeen, yeah. thinking that was enough. And before you know it, a year later, it's down at seven. So, 
Yeah, look, it's just to me, it's just clearly in a downtrend. Let's just keep it simple. It's going backwards. Um, we invest in things to go up, and at the moment, it's just not going up. So okay. Let's to... back both of those two from our me mental hard disk. Move on to another company that, if you look at the, the next chart, there's, there's uh, App and APX. Mm. Uh, it's had a, a, a terrible sell off as well, but at least it's trying to build a base from what I can see. Yeah, potentially. So there was, there was a bit of support around $15, which broke under a couple of months ago. Um, and we can see that, that since I think about May, it's tried to, it's tried to rally, but it hasn't been able to get above that, um, that key level near $15. So I think as long as it stays above that May low, um, as you say, Peter, potentially it's just going to base build. So we might find that this thing drifts sideways for a period of time before it's ready to head higher. Um, you could buy now, but you know, you, your money's tied up in something that's not moving. Plus, there's always the risk that it does actually break lower. So, look, I think it's one to keep an eye on. Clearly, if it can build enough of a base for a while, um, and then if it can get going above $15, then there's potentially an uptrend there for you. And I guess what we have to hope for is that the, the news that brought Apple down and the coronavirus period and the, the, um, the, the machinations of US companies that were really important to Apple, um, makes you want to think, well, even if, even if half the, the business returns and it can get to $20, where it was over $40, you'd think, well, there's a nice $8 to be made on top of 12. Not a bad return, but I guess this reporting season is going to be an interesting one to see whether the, the CEO can come out and say things are starting to look up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, communication is a big, big part of it, and I think... Um, you know, part of the declines we saw earlier in the year were as a result of, well, I suppose you could say, communication by the company could have been a bit better. Um, so well, let's see what they do this time around. Yeah. Let's go to an, another interesting, you know, uh, traditional Australian name, and that is Bega Cheese, B-G-A. And this is a, a very different chart from what we've been looking at in the past. So tell us what you're seeing here, mate. So up until recently, this this was actually doing pretty well. And um, you'll notice that uh, if you look towards the left-hand side, um, early 2020, um, as we know, a lot of stocks peaked then, dropped quite a bit, um, and are only sort of getting back to those recent highs. Bega just kept kicking on. So, you know, great, great share price performance from Bega since um, the start of last year. Mm. Um, However, what I've noticed is there was a clear uptrend line that it was bouncing off, um, and I've got that diagonal line there. And it did break that a few weeks ago, so I've circled where it broke um, that, that uptrend line around 570-ish, yeah. um, and now it's, it's trading a bit more than 10% lower since it did that break. So at the moment, the uptrend's gone. Um, it is easing back, and I think it's just a matter of time yeah, we, uh, I wouldn't be rushing into it. I think we just have to give it time and wait for that, um, you know, wait for this current um, share price decline to, to ease. Uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, Peter, reporting season. So, you know, hopefully they report well and, um, and the market realises that it's quite cheap and it can bounce. But um, at the moment, it is getting sold off into the report. So I don't know if that's a, a sign that it might not be a good one. But I think for the moment, it's just best to stay on the sidelines here. Yeah, I, I wrote a story today where I just actually touched on what the analysts were saying about BGA, and they think there's got 25% upside, but that would probably take it back to that, that kind of channel and going forward. But at this point in time, looking at that chart, you wouldn't think it's going to be a, a, a big turnaround unless something comes out in reporting season that positively shocks the market. That's, that's right. And if it is a positive shock, as, as you say, because it's falling into the result, if it does get a good result and everyone realizes, well, hang on, this is actually a pretty pretty good result, um, then you could actually see a very good upside move. But I wouldn't want to preempt that. But but as you say, Peter, it's one to watch for the result because it has been sold off uh, leading into it. Uh, if it does surprise everyone, you could end up with a nice snap back up to those high levels. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see whether big is affected by lockdowns or Chinese bans and all those sorts of things that could be. Uh, disturbing normal uh, business life, but certainly 
it was doing well during a previous lockdown, so I, I can't really jump on that bandwagon. Mate, let's go to, to our next one, and that is Woodside, another sort of energy stock that's having challenges nowadays. Yeah, look, with um, with Woodside, it's uh, it's not trading too well at the moment. So we looked at that nice jump in June, anticipating uh, a bit of a rally. It's come back to support, which is around this sort of $22 region, $21.50. Um, it's tried to bounce off that a couple of weeks ago. It's back to support. Uh, look, as long as it stays above support, there's a chance it could it could continue to rally. But the longer it sits here at support, um, the weaker that prospect is. So what I mean by that is it, it you know, if it's going to rally, you know, get on with it. it. It shouldn't just be sitting down here at support. So um, I, I think in the next few days or so, we'll know whether that's going to happen or not. Um, and in my opinion, if it, if it breaks that blue line, um, that's, you know, that's not a good sign. And therefore um, I'd rather be out of it. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to um, my, no, this is, now that's that's the, the group I asked you to have a look at. And this is the one you want to look at. BLS Blue Scope. So yeah. what's it going about? Yeah, so. it did well recently, didn't it? Yeah, Blue Scope Steel. So this um so they're yet to report, but they did come to the market uh, a couple of weeks ago and um and provided guidance um ahead of market expectations. So, you know, Blue Scope's a cyclical stock as 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 you'd expect. Um, producing steel. So as the economy picks up, as housing construction um, and building picks up, so does demand for Blue Scope. So it's been trending higher, um, of course, over the last year. Uh, it peaked in April and then it basically headed sideways for a while. But as we could see on this particular chart with the diagonal blue line, we could see that every time it dipped, there was some good buying coming in. So, so it's giving us these higher lows obvious um, resistance there near $23. Uh, and then on, on the back of that, um, that market announcement a couple of weeks ago, it gapped up, which I've circled there on the chart. Um, and since then, it has just come back a bit. Of course, over the last couple of weeks, uh, there has been a bit of softness in resource stocks, but I have noticed that it's been on lower volume. So on the bottom right hand side of the chart, I've, I've indicated with the sloping line that volume has been decreasing on the way down. So the share price has sort of come back to, to retest that breakout. Um, and I think over the next few days, um, you know, sentiment comes back into resource stocks, this thing will, will continue rallying. So I think you could see some very good upside here in Blue Scope. Okay, mate, fantastic. Um, just generally speaking, what's your feeling about the market in, in, in general? I, I feeling this market needs a sell off or do you think it's mm -hmm. more likely to climb on Good reporting news. Oh, look! It, it seems it seems pretty resilient, and um, we do have that nice up, nice uptrend. Um, up until a couple of weeks ago, our market was spending a period of time uh, consolidating its recent moves. So I think it was over pretty much June, July. Um, we had this sideways movement in the market, so a bit of heat coming out generally in the market, uh, and now it's you know, and, and that was an opportunity for it to be sold off, of course, because of you know, COVID, not only here, but also uh, the pickup in, in infections overseas, but it's been able to hold and, and kick on higher. So, you know, I'm always happy to go with the trend. The trend is up. Um, yes, there'll be a, a correction at some point. Uh, I mean, there always is every couple of years for some, you know, reason or, or another. But for the moment, um, yeah, look, it's, um, it's, it's doing pretty well. We've had good moves in businesses like uh, CBA recently in their share prices. So, you know, they report soon. So I think over the next week or two, we'll start to get more of an indication uh, through reporting season if, if our market can kick on or not. But at the moment, the signs are pretty good. I'll summarise your answer as the trend is your friend until it bends. Thanks very much, Mike. Exactly. Thanks. <laughs> See you, mate. That's Mike Gable from Fairmont Equities. Well, joining me now is the CEO of Elmo Software. They reported today, and the first reactions that I got was that, well, the revenue was good, things were looking pretty um, positive, but the market is focused in on a thing called churn. Let's just see how the CEO of Elmo Software, Danny Lesson, see how he's reacted to the results so far. Danny, thanks for coming to the program. So how do you react to uh, the earnings so far? 
and the market reaction. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, as I said, I'm very pleased with the results. Um, uh, we're seeing um, organic growth um, verging back to uh, the high pre-COVID levels, uh, and outstanding results for the uh, small business segment with Breathe at uh, AR over 50% on an annualized basis and seeing signs of operational efficiency with uh, um, returning a positive uh, EBITDA. So it was all ticks for us and um, we're in a great position um, in terms of growing into FY22, which is reflected in our guidance. Well, let's, let's look at the, the best part of the result. T tell us what you think is a very good sign that the company is heading in the direction you want it to go. Well, uh, as I said, I'm returning to those pre-COVID uh, high growth rates. So if we can break it up, we're, we're really a two-segment business now. We've got a fit-for-purpose solution for the mid-market, that's the historical Almo platform, and a fit-for-purpose uh, solution for small businesses, that's the Breathe platform that came via acquisition. We'll start off with the small the small business platform, outstanding growth, annualized growth uh, coming in at 51.8%. Um, at, at time of acquisition, uh, we anticipated more uh, growth, more, more around 30% on an annualized recurring revenue basis. But um, we can see that this is uh, picked up in the second half and it's, it's really performing well. So that, that's really outstanding. And then looking at uh, the uh, the annualized recurring revenue growth in the mid-market, when we were sitting at the half year, on an annualized basis, it was under 13%, and now it's over 20%, so we're returning to that high level of growth. So it means that those tailwinds behind the adoption of cloud-based systems, and particularly ones to manage people, process, and pay, um, they, they're coming through now, and um, that's, that's very pleasing. So that's definitely one of the highlights. Mm -hmm. The other highlight is we're starting to see increased operational efficiency as we scale up. So if we look at our guidance um, and we're looking to go through that $100 million mark on an AR basis during FY22, is we're starting to see the benefits of scale in terms of operational efficiencies. And that has resulted in a positive EBITDA this year. And we'll see increasing efficiencies come through in 22 and 23. Okay. So you mentioned AR. Did you mean ARR, the, the average recurring revenue? Because that is an important measurement for a company like yours. Is that right? Yes. So annualized recurring revenue, um, that is the subscription revenue which uh, uh, reoccurs each year. Mm -hmm. And if we look at our revenue complexion, about uh, just over 90 Six percent of total revenue is recurrent. We call it annualized recurring revenue. Mm. Now that is the really that's the important um, revenue because it's not revenue in a point of time. It recurs um, in the following year. So that's really important, and that's how um, sub subscription-based software as a service companies can grow so quickly is by having firstly a high um, percentage of their revenue as recurrent as annualized recurring revenue. And number two, we're seeing high growth on that as well. So it does pyramid from year to year. But I don't need any um, encouragement to recognise that the market can be crazy at times. And I'm sure as a CEO of a company that has reported well in the terms that you've already expressed, while well, you might be a little bit you know, annoyed, but not surprised the market has marked you down today. And what has been emphasised is that the churn rate uh, was around 11% or so which according to people who want to explain why they might be selling uh, your stock today, is that churn rate seems high. What do you say to people who are pointing that out? Yeah, so look, it's fair comment. It did come in at just over 11% on, on an on a, on a AR basis. But if we look at it half on half, we look at the first half, it was just over 12%. And in the second half, that actually reduced to uh, uh, around about 10% on our AR basis. So we're seeing that this COVID-related churn is actually starting to subside. And we do believe that it will go down um, uh, as we go through FY22. And it should settle in FY23 at, at around about 7%, which is the pre-COVID levels. So it is fair comment, but it is a COVID-related churn. It's coming down. 
And if we look at our uh, the complexion of our incremental annualized recurring revenue, we see um, in FY21 around about 75% of that incremental annualized recurring revenue coming from um, new businesses coming onto the platform and only 25% coming from existing businesses. Normally it's a more even skewer. And what this is telling me and what it should be telling the market is that there are huge tailwinds behind the adoption of Elmo and class-based technology. There's a lot of companies that are now automating um, because of the new way of working with remote-based workforces, et cetera, to manage their people process and pay, they need to have a cloud-based platform. So that's very pleasing. If we look at the other side of the ledger where we've been affected by a slightly a slight increase in churn, which as I said, is coming down half and half, is that is a point in time churn. That will go away. So when we start to see um, uh, incremental revenue or annualized recurring revenue coming through from existing customers as we get reduced churn, that we should see uh, quite a big increase in our, in our total revenue as we get through that base. So um, is churn is COVID related. Um, and it is coming down. So that's good news going forward. It, it seems to me that um, fortunately for you, you have a very um, thick head of hair, despite the fact you do decide to keep it short. Um, I wouldn't treat your hair with such mis uh, mistreatment if I had the same amount of hair as you, but it's, it's not affecting you sleep-wise. You're not losing any hair over the fact that lockdowns have continued to prevail upon the economy. Now, I know in the past you've made the point that you thought the market and often some media reports suggested that you were a, a beneficiary of lockdown and you didn't think that was necessarily the case, though you did think down the track you, it, it would be. So do you believe that the current lockdown is not helping you um, uh, in terms of companies that may well be feeling the pinch and there's a consequence they may well add it to your churn as a consequence of that. Yeah, look, uh, in, in the short term, in the mid-market, um, previously where we saw in, at the end of FY20, it did delay procurement, um, uh, having those snap lockdowns. Um, companies were used to procuring when where the whole team was in the office and it was more difficult. Um, what we saw with the uh, SNAP lockdowns, which occurred, they started occurring two weeks before the end of the financial year, we saw a different approach uh, uh, by procurement and mid-market organizations. They were used to procuring um, uh, remotely. So it's, it doesn't have the same effect. We, we're not seeing the same effect in the second set of lockdowns as the first set of lockdowns, firstly. We, we, had, we had a lot of activity, a lot of deals signed in at the end of Q4 under lockdown. So that's, um, we can see that the way organizations are behaving, the way that they're procuring, they have adapted, they've moved on to uh, from what we experienced last financial year. So that's that's a good sign. But if we want to look, uh, uh, look, I suppose, through the looking glass or down the rabbit hole of what it's going to look like post COVID, um, we've got about between 20 and 25% of our revenue coming out of the UK. And the UK have attained the vaccine thresholds. They've opened up the economy, no more lockdowns. And what we're seeing is a, a, a huge economic tailwind. It, it's, uh, there's a lot of economic revival there, um, uh, which is um, translated in um, expenditure, in, um, particularly in, um, in technology. And we've seen this come through quite quickly um, with the small business platform Breathe with that 51.8% uh, um, uh, return on AR basis or increase in AR basis this year. So I believe um, we, we're probably six to eight weeks behind the UK once we attain that and our, 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 we, we end our lockdowns, our rolling lockdowns, uh, there'll be a stronger economy and there'll be this huge tailwind behind adoption because the workplace has changed. Is it's more hybrid, there are people working remotely and in office, et cetera, and that reliance on cloud-based technology is, is, is it's much greater than it was before. So yeah, um, uh, obviously we wouldn't like to be in lockdown, but um, we do see an end to it and we see a big upside post, uh, post lockdowns in, in Australia and New Zealand. Well, Danny, thanks for joining us, mate. Good luck. I will throw to you though, I was 
interviewing Larry Diamond from Zip recently as a consequence of that Afterpay development. And uh, he made the point that he actually is a customer of Elmo Software. Yeah, um, uh, Larry is one of our customers and um, again, a full head of hair. Um, but uh, the difference between uh, Larry and myself is, uh, uh, Peter, you've referred to me as, as a computer geek, but you haven't referred to Larry as one. <laughs> okay, one of these days I, I might mistreat him as well. Thanks for coming from the program. Dan. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peter. Bye. Become an annual Switzer Report subscriber and get unprecedented access to my seven investing principles where I reveal the exact strategies I use to invest. You'll get access to an exclusive PDF, video recording and even a free copy of my book, Join the Rich Club. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, a Switzer Report subscription is one of the wisest investments you can make towards your future. Find out more at switzerreport.com.au slash YouTube offer or click on the link in the description below. Well, joining us now is Jim Bailu from Tribeca Alpha Plus. Good to see you, Jim Bailu. Great to see you, Pisa. How are you today? Very good. Very good. Now, I'd like to see what you've seen today in terms of reporting, anything that you like or you didn't like. Yeah, look, today the reporting season obviously has kicked stars um, quite, quite, quite strongly. Um, and we saw, we saw today Elmo had a um, earnings update. Um, you know, we thought the sales number was pretty good. So, however, the cash burn is, um, you know, quite quite high, um, just given that, you know, they're trying to catch the sales and the capitalizing a little bit more things than expected. Um, so uh, look at the while the company continue to grow, but it certainly seems like the balance sheet is going to, um, you know, going to uh, perhaps needs, um, needs a bit more capital in the next 12 months. Um, so, and we see many companies sort of sitting in that camp, but top line looks good. It's just the balance sheet requires perhaps where the capital raising or something else to help it to continue to capture that growth. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's uh, Elmo. What else have you seen today that you've liked or didn't like? Look, today, um, I'm actually trying to think what, uh, what, what result came out. It's a pretty quiet day. Um, we saw from, oh, we've got uh, Horizon had a good result. Um, it, um, it, you know, it's a beat expectations. Um, but the tricky thing is, um, it's, it is a company that has exposure to um, export in coal volume. Um, and they gave a guidance of 5% growth in volume. And uh, look, you know, that might be, um, you know, to um, whether it's conservative or whether it's, um, you know, that might be at risk because it's very difficult to call what that volume is. And what's been increasingly, um, you know, obvious over the last um, uh, five years is that there's been less and less in new investors going to um, you know companies that have that big exposure to uh, to coal businesses so that company even though it beat expectations share price ha hasn't really done anything um, so you know it's sort of in line sort of expectations uh, a big one actually today the positive one is actually Suncorp um, it had a good result <laughs> um, you know I know it's been a perennial disappointment but the result was pretty good and they talked to um, you you know, um, uh, the, the, the capital return. And that is very, very positive. And I think that's going to be a very key theme to drive things forward, especially this reporting season. Buybacks, capital return, high dividend is going to drive a lot of companies by this sense. So some corp is up more than 6%. Um, and that's quite a big move for that stock. So do you see the fact that Suncorp is doing well in the financial spaces at all as well for its competitors as well? Yeah, it certainly does. Um, it does bode well for the likes of QBE. And also it has pointed to um, higher rates um, for commercial lines. And that bodes really well for the likes of uh, the brokers um, for those commercial uh, insurance products, such as uh, Steadfast or Ausbrokers. So, you know, they will report pretty strong earnings and share price has performed well, but still we're expecting even stronger earnings come from both of those names as well. Okay, let's go to a couple of companies that I've got uh, Mike gave on my charts is having a look at. And this comes from feedback we get from, uh, from people who watch the show. Uh, two real struggling companies that used to be stars, namely Origin and AGL. What do you think of those companies? Are, they, are those companies a, a bit like Horizon? Forget about them because they've got so many, so many headwinds. 
uh, I think uh, AGR certainly is in that camp. Um, you know, look at the um, electricity prices has, um, you know, the, the uh, exposure to that electricity prices has been struggled for so many years. Um, and uh, even though recently we are seeing a bit of rally in the electricity prices uh, across some states um, because of the disruption uh, took place in Queensland, uh, but that is still not enough to uh, rescue the earnings outlook. Um, we just saw update out of origin on how, you know, how troubling that troubling that uh, you know energy markets business is but on the other hand for origin there is something quite interesting about it it does have exposure to that apl and g which um, does mean that um, it has very nice leverage into the higher oil prices um, and, and it, um, so you know on that basis origin certainly looks like a much um, better positioned business compared to the likes of AGL. Now, AGL is going through a de-separation uh, of its core business and, you know, the green part of the business as well as the dirty part of the business, um, but it requires capital uh, to, to, to have that separation in place. Um, and based on the current, um, you know, operating environment, it is very, very tough for that business. So certainly that one is difficult for investors to put new money in. Um, but, you know, Origin perhaps is one of those value names. Um, you will see big payback um, out of the earnings out of that APLNG business. Well, I'm going to ask you about bigger cheese. And it's interesting, the analysts think there's upside. And similarly, and there's a Costa group, there's upside yeah. there as well. But I always worry about food businesses because things can go wrong with food businesses. You know, droughts aren't great for Costa group. I guess even the drought wouldn't be good for, for, for milk and therefore cheese. But the chart doesn't. The chart looks fantastic for Bega until a recent time has come off the boil. What's your view on that company, Bega Cheese? Yeah, bigger cheese is probably a hold for me. Um, you know, I wouldn't be rushing to buy it. Uh, look, you're absolutely right. Um, agriculture business, um, you know, people like to buy those business because when things are good, um, you know, it's they make a lot of return out of the fixed asset, uh, fixed cost base, and the operating leverage is enormous. Um, but like you said, so many things can go wrong, whether it's the, you know, for Costa, whether it's fruit fly, whether it's the weather, that the too wet, too cold during the wrong point of season, all of these things could, could go wrong. Now, these are the companies you want to buy them cheap. You know, you want to buy them when things are going wrong because eventually weather will normalize. So bigger cheese right now, the issue is uh, share price has performed quite well. And recently it's mainly because um, they made the acquisition um, uh, and that we think there will be some synergies coming through and that's in the share price. Um, the main thing is that the, um, there's been a bit of competition for milk volume out of Victoria. Um, and so that means, you know, the price you have to pay a little bit higher. So potentially into the result, there be higher cost, um, you know, associated that's not in the uh, analyst numbers. And that is uh, perhaps, you know, could be your entry point, um, you know, wait for those periods. Okay. Woodside, this has been a perennial disappointer. You know, you, if, if everyone ever asked me, you know, do you, should I be in oil? I say, yeah, but you could go into Woodside, but it always disappoints. And I must have been unlucky. I bought it around $17. So even at the current prices, I'm in the money, but I was hoping to go to 30 and it just doesn't look like it's going to do that. Oh, absolutely. That is one company that you're hoping will give you the leverage to the oil prices and yet to keep disappointing operationally. Um, so this is one part where you have to be um, in, uh, uh, be careful when you invest through um, thematic investing. Um, you know, in the oil space, we prefer to the likes of Oil Search and uh, Centos simply because there's a lot of synergy when it does combine. You know, there's a lot of value that can be created even for the short term. The cash looks great and all of that. Um, lots of synergy. So that is a much more exciting space. We'll say in the short term, actually, there is a bit of news flow coming through. Potentially, BHP will sell its business um, in that um, you know energy space, and if Wusai is going to take it on there's been a bit of rumor about they are going to um you know they require capital so you know i i'm not sure um you know how many shareholders will be stepping up for wood science they're looking you know happy to for you to raise lots of money um at this point of cycle so you know much rather to be sitting in the likes of oil search and centos um and you know i prefer bhp even on that front given the catalyst that's coming through yeah okay one last one this is a bit of a curve or national storage um you know when someone asked me about it I looked at the chart, the chart looks pretty good. And I guess in this, this age of people at home buying far too much stuff because they can't go overseas, they're going to end up with a, a, a big need to get a storage garage and store all the stuff they're buying. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Look, national storage. So one part is commercial, one part is personal. Um, you know, the storage space has gone through incredible amounts of, uh, um, you know, um, boom. Um, one is, uh, you know, because people bought lots of stuff. It's also to do with housing turnover as well. Um, so when people, you know, moving houses, they tend to require a lot of that and huge leverage. So very good uh, operating environment. And uh, they offer a pretty, still pretty good yield relative to the others. So, um, you know, it's, it's in a pretty good spot at this point. Yeah, and I guess they also benefit from the fact that more and more people are living in apartments. When you live in apartments, you don't have as much garage space to fill up with all the stuff you can't throw out. Absolutely. Look, um, many say this is a structurally growth area. Um, you know, many argue its, um, it's rate should be uh, stronger than the industrial um, type of yield that, that's being traded. Uh, but even the industrial pro property, when you think about it, um, there's been, you know, all the demand from Amazon and all these online um, space. So look at Goodman Group sort of valuation. Um, it certainly makes these sort of assets very unique and, uh, you know, looks quite attractive. Jimbo Lu, next time we talk, there'll be a lot of companies that are reported. I look forward to talking to you then. Speak soon. Thank you. Coming on the program now is Paul Rickard, who's been looking at the companies that have been reporting today. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. Let's kick off with Suncorp. It, uh, it actually did a, a, a nice report for a change. Yeah, look, it impressed the market, Peter. Look, a very um, workmanlike result with increase in both the insurance profit contribution and also um, the contribution from banking. On the banking side, net interest margin up, to, I think it was 13 basis points. Plus, they got some home loan growth, home loan growth in the second half that helped. So they, they um, beat market expectations quite by about $100 million, uh, a higher dividend than was expected plus a special dividend of $0.08, cents, and then together, Peter, a, uh, an off -mark, a on market share buyback of $250 million. So a good result sets up the banking reporting season to be pretty strong. Uh, and I think you saw on the back of that as a result, IAG rallied a bit because obviously uh, insurance premiums are going up, so that's good for IAG. You saw QBE go up as well. So a lot of support across the financials today, I think, coming on part because of a pretty solid start by that report from Suncorp. And we should explain to people, part of the reason why these financial institutions have a low capital is that they were really scared that the economic collapse from the coronavirus was going to be worse than it turned out to be. So they held back, didn't they, in many ways last year. And so they, they've got a nice supply of capital. There. Yeah, I mean, Suncorp's uh, banking profit, which is about, a, about 30%, Peter, uh, that was up mainly because of a right back of provisions. So it doesn't have to, uh, last year, all the banks set aside a lot of capital for COVID-19. And of course, it didn't transpire as bad as many feared at the time. And uh, now we're all seeing the rewards of that in the sense of much higher dividends, uh, a lot of buybacks around the cards with uh, Suncorp adding to the party that NAB and ANZ have already started uh, and a good outcome for shareholders. So bank shareholders are going to do pretty well. Yeah. I'm interested in Transurban, Paul, because it's a company you've liked in the past. You, you've been a little bit negative on it that you couldn't expect it to go much higher. And of course, people aren't driving as much and Transurban makes money when people are going through um, toll lows. What happened with Transurban today? Well, I think some of the gloss has come off Transurban a bit, Peter. And if anything, um, we've seen a few um, development um, hurdles in the sense that North Connex took longer than expected now there are a lot of troubles with the Westgate Tunnel in Melbourne uh, and Transurban saying that potentially the cost on that will blow out by at least another $3.3 billion. I think originally it was estimated to cost about $6.7. We're now up to 10. We're still counting. Um, originally the completion date was 2023. Now it's, well, we don't know when. <laughs> um, it's sometime. So a lot of problems there. And that's not that totally their own fault, but it's a lot of argy-bargy between them and other contractors and the Victorian government. So but they used to have a very good execution record and that's sort of been slipping a little bit. Add to that as well, Peter, the problems with the traffic. Of course, um, you know, the average daily traffic was only down about 0.4% on last year. But when you compare it to 2019, which was pre-COVID, yeah. and you adjust for the extra, they didn't have as many motorways then, we're still down 15%. Yeah. Um, and that tells you some of the challenges that they continue to have. So, look, a, a pretty much 
a result that but the market was expecting. There were no surprises in terms of the distribution uh, and their forecast for next year. But but really, just this uh, news on the Westgate Tunnel. It's a pretty expensive stock, Peter. I mean, it's only yielding about two and a half percent. That's unfranked, and you're trading above fourteen dollars. Um, and it's probably, I would say, most people think it's pretty fully priced. Yeah, without a doubt, particularly with those curveballs. Of course, things will improve in a year's time, we hope, once the current coronavirus is contained. But still, if those blow out in costs, that's not going to help for a year or two as well. And finally, Paul, let's go to the company called Horizon. Yeah, I mean, that's the old Queensland National Rail, Peter, that does all the haulage of uh, coal, owns both the... Uh, a, a, a below ground in terms of the track and in many cases the locomotives that haul a lot of the call to the ports in Queensland plus some bulk handling in in WA look it's 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 a company that a lot of income players have liked because it's playing a very attractive uh, dividend yield uh it basically came out on an on par result um no revenue growth and no earnings growth expected again for next year in fact earnings could be a little bit lower but when you're yielding um almost 7% and that's with 70% franking on top of that, uh, it's pretty hard for to see the share price go down too low. So it actually rallied. I think it probably, in, in some ways, the, the volumes hauled were a little bit better than expected because there had been some fears that the whole issue around thermal coal, and particularly, you know, volumes would fall. But in fact, they've held up pretty well, notwithstanding COVID-19 and some of the ESG concerns or ESG pressures are out there. So... Uh, and not a bad result and um, a company that's really working very hard, very capital efficient company uh, and um, look, not much growth, I suspect, but uh, an attractive yield. Do you buy any of those three companies you're, you've talked about? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm tempted by Suncorp. I've, I'm, I've been playing the insurance market through IAG rather than Suncorp. Um, but on the back of that, I said IAG rallied. I, I have felt for a while that insurance companies were going to benefit because we had a lot of disasters. Premiums have gone up. Um, and they've been able to get reinsurance. So I think the Suncorp result's pretty strong, Peter. Um, it's, it's a workmanlike result. It's not in the same class as, as Commonwealth Bank in terms of its banking business, but it seems reasonably on track. So I think there's, there's potential there. And Horizon, I think, lower down, there's still ESG issues that surround that whole sector. So there's probably more selling to come. But when it gets back into the 380s, I think Horizon looks attractive. Particularly for dividend players, I guess. Yeah. Transurban, I think, is pretty fully priced. I can't see the upside in Transurban. Okay. Paul Rickard from the Switch Report. And he, he writes about all these sorts of things in the report. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter.